Hello and welcome, Shannon Halliday. Hi, thanks for having me. This is great. Hi, great, Shannon. Great to have you with us. Shannon, tell us everything we need to know about you in 60 seconds. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Uh, I, I really liked skateboarding as growing up. I listened to punk rock. Uh, took an acting class when my band broke up, moved to L.A., became a Christian at Grace Community Church. Uh, decide, I moved up for acting. Decided to still stick with film, been pursuing film for the last 25 years, working in that field and still going to Grace Community Church. Converged all together recently, two years ago, where they wanted me to make this documentary. That's great. That's great. And we're going to spend the next half an hour or so unpacking all of that great yeah. stuff. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. How did you become a Christian? Uh, okay. Yeah, so I grew up in the Lutheran Church, and... Uh, I always considered myself a Christian. I knew the gospel, um, but I didn't, uh, I didn't follow Christ. There was no fruit of faith in my life. And, um, I just did whatever I wanted and, and also called myself a Christian. Um, and then, like I said, I was, I was playing in a lot of bands at that time. My band broke up, broke up. I took an acting class, fell in love with acting, was just doing theater all over San Diego. That's where I grew up in San Diego. And moved up to Los Angeles, dropped everything, and I was going to pursue acting. Just, just you know, that I was going to, you know, seize life and and get what I want out of it, and that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a, I wanted to be in big movies and all that kind of stuff. You know, the normal stuff. I was probably, in, I guess, I was twenty, twenty one, and uh, uh, moved up here and struggled and became friends with a person who went to Grace Community Church, another fellow actor. And he invited me, started inviting me to Bible studies. And the first, and I, I showed up to Grace Community Church. I had no idea anything about it. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about Reformed theology. I couldn't tell you anything. Um, and uh, I remember my first day there, um, you know, we were in the big church. John MacArthur preached. I can't tell you what he preached on. I don't remember. I do remember going into another one where Lance Quinn, I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was preaching in Grace Life at the time, and he preached a sermon, and it somehow ended up with him talking about the return of Christ. And uh, he said something that I thought was just so interesting. He said, and Jesus is going to actually physically return on this earth, and his feet are going to touch the ground, and he is going to return, and we're all going to see him. And it's it's going to be real. <laughs> and I thought, I never thought about beyond that. I never thought about the return of Christ. I never thought about end times and judgment and him coming back and judging everybody. And I thought, this is fascinating. And I remember these two old ladies in the front were just so excited about it because he's like, and isn't that going to be great that Jesus is going to return? And they were like, yeah, this is going to be awesome. And I was like, that's, I, I, I don't really have that. That's interesting. Um, and then I started going to a Bible study and the first book that was the first book I ever studied, it's the book of James. And it's dealing with, as you know, works being the result of your faith. And uh, through the study of that book, I realized, you know, I am a Christian now somehow. I understand the gospel and actually what it means. I, 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 I understand I'm a sinner. I'm I'm repentful over my sin, which I really wasn't before. Like my sin bothers me. And I was and I was praying and confessing and I desired to read the Bible and I wanted to submit my life to Christ as my king and run everything through him, which was absent before. So now I was actually following Christ and it just soaked in that year. And I couldn't tell you when it happened, honestly. I didn't have that kind of dramatic moment. Um, it just, I realized I'm a Christian and I started to realize, but I wasn't, I clearly wasn't before at, you know, growing up, I thought I was, and I wasn't. Yeah, um, yeah. so then I just started getting plugged in at grace from there on out. And, um, so yeah, uh, been there ever since. Um, and then I, I lost the desire to pursue acting and, um, I always was a storyteller at the end of the day. And I think acting was just a way to be intimately involved in the story. So the art and craft of filmmaking, of storytelling, visual storytelling, I really just dove into that and um, stretched myself in that, in, in my understanding of that and tried to always hone my craft 
and work hard at that in writing and directing. And so over the last few decades, I've been doing that with my own stuff. I worked for a studio where we primarily focused on commercials. Um, so I was doing more in short form kind of stuff. Um, I've written a screenplay, was been optioned, but didn't get made. I've written other screenplays that I would never show anybody, but they were just good, good exercises to do and get through. But just constantly always pursuing the craft of, you know, the foundation of filmmaking, which is visual storytelling. So yeah. that's that's and so then yeah that's that's it i won't go beyond that you just asked me how did i get saved that's that's the answer no that's brilliant that's, <laughs> that's really good stuff so were you involved with any commercials that we might recognize no i don't think so i think they're they were all internet youtube stuff for small and large businesses a lot of corporations nothing that i think anybody would write home about to be honest with you <laughs> right sure 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 <laughs> You're the man behind the essential church move, and it's possible that you are the most interviewed man on the planet right now. How did this movie come about, and how did you get involved? Yeah, I um, I was working for that studio, um, dealing with a huge marketing firm that had tons of clients, and that's all I was focused on. And I was really just kind of seeing that as a good, steady job uh, as a head writer and sometime creative director. Um, but uh, I was also for, you know, just working on my own stuff at the same time, but that was providing a good steady income for me. So I was happy about that. And then the lockdowns happened and I was helping out with Grace Church. Um, they uh, have a program for kids that they, it's a, their replacement for Awana. It's called Adventure Club. And I was overseeing the story, the adventure. They realized they didn't actually come up with an adventure for the books <laughs> so they're like we need help coming up with that so i was overseeing that i wasn't really writing it but i was just kind of conceptually making sure it was on in a good direction and um helping brainstorm with that uh and then uh they you know they started because of covid the church started to get more involved in in media and there was more opportunities there and i was asked to come on um and I said, no, at first I said, I don't think that's what I want to do. I don't want to go work for my church. Uh, I don't think that's a good career move, to be honest with you. Uh, and then a month or two went by and I started to feel differently about it. And then I was asked again. And I think the Lord had worked on my heart and kind of revealed some things to me about my situation. And I thought, you know what, this is actually a good opportunity because I feel like the church for the first time what in media is in my observation was moving in a direction that I had not seen it move in before. And so to, I kind of saw, uh, you know, a metaphorical door start to open uh, in the church. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try to go through the door and see what happens. And uh, let's see what becomes of this. And I'm going to take a risk. Uh, which is honestly, that's all I've ever done my whole life is take risks. The problem is they don't always work out. <laughs> uh, but uh, this risk, I think, worked out so far. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so I went through that door and that's and and then it became like, OK, we're moving into more media. What what's the first project we want to do? And the thought of, you know, let's do a documentary was brought forward. And I was like, that's a no brainer. Let's do a documentary on this of what just happened to us. It's it's needed. I think the church will want it. I think Dr. MacArthur will want it. Uh, I think there are elders that will want it. So it makes a lot of sense that that would be the pitch. And so I was asked to put together how I would um, put this story together. And I yeah. thought through it and did some research on the story. And of course, I lived through it, but I needed to go beyond that in my understanding. And uh, that's when I put it all together with the church history I wanted to make about the church, not just John MacArthur and, and Grace Community Church, which is what they wanted as well, um, and make sure that the global aspect was represented as well for the church. So we have the past, our local church, and the global church in, in the film. And it's those three stories I wanted to, to weave through. And that is really how I explained it to them. And at the time, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily know the exact nooks and crannies of certain things. But in general, I had a certain idea of some things and uh, and they were OK with that. They greenlit it and started working. 
Yeah. Well, I'm sure I speak on behalf of a lot of people. We're really glad that you changed your mind and got involved with this project. Now, I've got to say, I've never seen a Christian movie show up so much on my social media. You guys have done an outstanding job of uh, spreading the word about this project. Give us an overview of what the movie's about and why it's so important to us today. Yeah, um, I think it's important for us today because I think the movie is focused on something that it's a muscle that hasn't really been exercised all that much especially in America, but I would probably say in the UK as well. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's not something um, that we've thought about a lot because it's not something that's challenged us. And the lockdowns really stretched us in our understanding of what it means uh, in our relationship with the state as the church. What is the relationship? What is that relationship supposed to be like? What are the boundaries and where should we actually hold to our convictions on it? Um, and that became really mushy during that time. And people didn't know where the convictions should land because I think they were informed by a lot of other things that had seeped into their Christian worldview and not just these fundamental things and why they're important. And that's why church history is so important to me to include in the film because you can see the, the steel in the veins of the people of the past, the yeah. church of the past. You can see what they did. And that's in your land, right? That happened yeah. in your territory, Great Ejection, and then the Scots next to you there. Like that, that all happened there. And what they had to work through biblically really informs us today. And that's why it was so important. And I think that helps us understand the importance of that conviction and why we should have that conviction as well. And so yeah. we, that's, that's, uh, what was your question again? Why did I make it or what is it? What am I hoping to do with it? I think you've, you, you've, you've answered it, Shannon. You, okay. The question Good. was, <laughs> give us an overview of the movie and why it's important. And you've, you've covered that off. Okay. I'll tell you right. what we're going to do. Let's cut to the trailer for those that haven't seen it yet. And then we'll come back and pick up this interview again. God's truth is enduringly true throughout all the generations. It transcends culture. The church is always going to be an embattled people. If it's swimming with the tide, it's not being the church of Jesus Christ. Look to the past, learn from the past, because the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. China has more than 200 confirmed cases of coronavirus, it's called. The entire state of California ordered to stay at home. That's 40 California years. has some of the strictest policies leveled against churches. Gavin Newsom's executive order threatens jail time and a $1,000 a day fine. Government that stopping people from going to church, Dr. Fauci. When I went into the White House, when I sat in on the task force meetings, was a shocking level of gross incompetence. The mortality rate from the virus was 0.2%. You know, 99.8% survival, rather than the three or four percent mortality that the, the people are saying at the time. The culture and the understanding of the people of Grace Church has always been: not only do you obey government, but you honor government. Thousands of people in the streets, but you can't have church. The hypocrisy of letting people riot it helped us all understand one thing: this is not what they say it is. By meeting, we're testifying the government has no jurisdiction here. I was arrested and driven to a maximum security prison. The government has obviously uh, turned up the heat on churches. My daddy. <laughs> when the churches fall silent, the only religion left is the state. We needed to make a biblical statement because we always put ourselves under the authority of the Word of God. LA County threatened Pastor John MacArthur with jail time and arrest. We were going to be sued. They wanted Grace Church shut down. We wanted to go on the offensive and attack the health order as unconstitutional. This wasn't about health and safety. This was all about control and opposition to religious freedom. As the government gets more corrupt and more corrupt, snitches get rewards. Its totalitarian control has to increase. And you have to have a mask on. And as they shut down any attacks against them. This is not about freedom or personal choice. The last thing standing is going to be the church.
brilliant stuff brilliant brilliant stuff grace community church like the majority of other churches shannon in the beginning did follow the instructions didn't they and, and close the doors what was the key thing that happened to make them want to reopen yeah i don't know if it was one thing and i would say as the film shows is that there is an evolution in in the matter and it wasn't something that happened overnight and the reason being is because we have an elder board we're and we're elder ruled and there's 40 elders and we have a principle of unanimity and they all have to be unanimous. So they were all unanimous at the beginning to say, okay, we'll heed this warning kind of like a hurricane. If we were in Florida and the state of Florida said, you know, you're going to die. So you need to leave and not be here. So in a way it was kind of the same thing. We're like, okay, well, we're ignorant to all of this. We'll heed your warning. After that was over, though, the elder board was not unanimous on how to move forward. Uh, John MacArthur was ready to come back. Other elders were ready to come back, but not all the elders. Quite a few elders were not ready to come back. And um, I think that it's important for people to understand that, because I think people look at Grace Community Church and they think uh, John MacArthur just runs everything. Um, and he just runs roughshod over everybody because he's a very, he, when he preaches, he preaches with conviction and it's very strong and it's a matter of fact. And, it, you know, there's no compromise in that. And so I think they just identify him as, oh, he's going to be like that with people. And he's actually very patient with people and, and humble, and he doesn't run roughshod over people. So I wanted to show that, that we are an elder board and they all have to agree. And they had to work through Romans 13 to eventually get there. And so that process to get there was a couple things. Them being challenged with Romans 13, which is Mike Riccardi's part. He kind of shows that evolution where he is at one place with Romans 13, but he realized he wasn't looking on the other side of the coin, that there was another side of the coin there that he needed to, to look at yeah. to recognize, okay, wait a second. Uh, I don't think I'm seeing this as fully as I should. And he goes into how he was reading Martin Lloyd Jones and things like that. Another Brit, right? right. Um yeah. <laughs> and uh uh so there's that evolution. That's what's changing it. And that took a little time for some people. And then other things they saw was the the riots. They saw the partiality from the politicians. The politicians were saying some things were essential while the church was not. And yeah. who are they to decide that the church isn't essential? Uh, when they are given that kind of authority to decide what is essential and isn't, and they're saying the church isn't essential, well, that really is a form of persecution in a way, because what they're saying is we're going to shut you down and we have the right to shut you down because we're the arbiter of truth. And we decide that the protests are essential, strip clubs are essential, liquor stores are essential, marijuana dispensaries are essential, Costco is essential. You can pack Costco and Walmart. But you couldn't, and every day you could do that, but you couldn't go to church on Sunday. So why am I not going to die at Costco, but I am going to die at church? Yeah. Um, so uh, that started to bubble up and they started to see that all of this, and then there's more data that was coming out. So there's plenty of things. And, but basically at the end of the day, they had to agree theologically. Those things may have pushed them, but they had to agree, yes, the Bible says this, and it applies to us in this way. And the Bible has a correct interpretation, and we need to know that correct interpretation and then apply it correctly. And um, that's where they had to become united. And honestly, if they didn't become united over that, as I show in the movie, the stakes were high. Grace Church yeah. could never be the same again. This really was a challenge. And the church had a target on it, and it was a, a challenge given to us that they had to figure out. And if they didn't figure out, it, everything could be ruined. There would be great division within the church if they didn't figure it out at the top. Yeah. I love the transparency in showing the process of the elders and what they went through in coming to that united decision and opening back up. We live in a day, don't we, of, of brand management in terms of, you know, wanting to make sure that we're always showing our best face. Was there ever a temptation not to show that and, and, and instead portray this, you know, united yeah. picture all the way through? Right. Well, that was my greatest fear in pitching it, that they would shoot that down. Because I didn't know what was going to happen because I knew that that had to be a part of the documentary for it to just be a good film. 
Yeah. It can't be yeah. a good film if you completely hide all the flaws, if you will, of of the messiness and the tension and the conflict within the protagonist, which is the church. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's just good good storytelling, right? So I knew that had to be in there, and I was hoping. I'm like, I hope they realize that. So when I pitched it to him that I wanted to be more transparent and I even originally I wanted to get more people that were opposed to us, which was hard to do. And honestly, we ran out of time. I had a deadline on this that was kind of crazy. So I did what I could in the deadline. But I they they agreed with me that it needed to be transparent, especially Chris Hamilton, who honestly was the main reason why it works, because his interview really brings that transparency to those moments. Uh, the one thing that Dr. MacArthur said was, yeah, you can do that, but just don't make our people feel like second class citizens that disagreed with us. So yeah. do it in a way that we don't expose them or badmouth them, you know, yeah. um, but still are transparent about the conflict. And I think I was able to accomplish that. Yeah. You speak about Ian Hamilton's uh, involvement with the project. You do a great job of reflecting on church history throughout this movie. Uh, tell us about that, Shannon. Why, why was that so important to be included as well? Yeah, and as I said earlier, the importance of that is is obviously that's that helps us flesh out the concept to see how they fleshed out the concept and at, make us ask the question, why is it so important to them? You know, why was this so important to them to the point that they would die? It, should that be our conviction? It was their conviction. Why is that their conviction? Um, so uh, there is that aspect of it. But as a storyteller as well, it, not only are the stories rich, and as a filmmaker, as I looked in and researched those stories, I was like, oh, man, I can't wait to tell this story. I want to tell this one. I want to tell this one. Uh, you know, I, I know I want to like write it and fashion it and craft it. I was super excited as a filmmaker, but also I believe that it brings, it gives the film a transcendence that it would not have if I just focused on COVID and lockdowns. Um, it's, and it, it, it gives that theology a story um, that because of that transcendence, hopefully 20, 30 years from now, if somebody were to watch this documentary, it would still be interesting to them. It would still be compelling to them because what's behind it and what's through it is this transcendent truth that applies yeah. regardless of yeah. the situation. Yeah. There's a, there's a, I mean, the film sets are beautiful. You've done a great job of finding the locations to film as well. There's a really distinct, I think it's a green um, room if I remember rightly. Tell me that's Ian Hamilton's front room. <laughs> Dude, I got a crazy story about that room. Because that's actually, do you know who um, William McKenzie is? Uh, the Christian Focus. Uh, yes. Oh, right, okay. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we show up to in, in Inverness, which is where William lives. I didn't know him at the time. I have no idea who he was. I didn't know Christian right. Focus or any of that. Uh, we show up to Inverness. Just a really quick little story. We show up there. We, I found an Airbnb while we were in, in the States that had a living room that I could transform into like a Scottish study. And that's right, where I was right. going to interview Ian. And then we would have our rooms and our kitchen and all that upstairs. It was perfect. And so we had that for a few days so we could live there and film there. Um, and none would be the wiser. So uh, it was great. Uh, but we showed up. It was probably nine at night. And we're trying to get into this place. It's dark. There's no key. We're trying to contact the person. We're like, we can't get into the house. And they said, well, it's booked. You know, and we're like, yeah, we booked it. I'm like, no, no, no. It's booked by somebody else. So somehow, I don't know how, this thing got double booked. Right. I don't know how that happens on the internet. Uh, but regardless, that's what happened. So we lost our house and our set. And we're in Inverness with like just a, car full of equipment yeah. and that's it we have nowhere to stay we don't know anybody <laughs> so the only person i know is ian i know and i just know him because i talked to him on the phone a couple of times i don't really know him know him yeah. um yeah. and so i call ian i'm saying this is our situation and he's like well i have a friend let me call him and so he calls him and he says so i have this friend and he says he might have a scottish thing that could be a scottish study with a fireplace which is what i wanted and he might be able to put you up tonight. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Turns out it's William McKenzie. 
he he has a super nice house. He had tons of kids, so each of us get a room now. His wife is going to take care of us, feed us breakfast. I mean, we went from no home to like the best home in Inverness, <laughs> having our own room with uh, you know, a a couple who just wants to host you and just loves hosting people. And we're we're singing psalms in the morning. They're preparing breakfast for us. And then he says, "Yeah, and I have this place." this home that was built in the 1750s. And I have six fireplaces you can choose from uh, that would fit a Scottish study, every single one of them. And I was like, "Uh, okay, let's go. And so we drive up. He owns all of this farmland on the coast in Port Mahamic. Um, And it's all barley, which he makes for a McLaren whiskey. Uh, So he provides that for... so. It's an amazing, we went from like nothing to like the very best you could possibly have. And I said, when we lost our home and our set, I said afterwards, you know, usually so far when this has happened during this project, that means when something happens and I have no power to correct it, like I can't solve the issue. I tried. There's no way I can solve this issue. That usually meant in my mind, oh, well, that means something better is in plan. Right, something right, yeah. that is already better in store. Yeah. That means the Lord yeah. didn't like what we were doing and he has something better yeah. for us. And that's exactly, yeah. I said that. And literally 20 minutes after that, that's exactly what happened. That uh, so so that green room, that green room was gifted to us by God through William McKenzie. Um, and it was amazing. I mean, we even got a tour of other covenanter sites and churches uh on the way up there and he was telling us these stories and it was just amazing it was an amazing time well that that was a long story but yeah no it's brilliant (laughs) brilliant stuff i mean it couldn't work couldn't have worked out any better did did they um make you eat haggis when you was up there shannon (laughs) they did not make me i made myself um but i did it and i i talked to our drone guy and he said get haggis at this one cabin in glencoe that's the best haggis in scotland and so I went there and I had haggis and I loved it. I really liked it. Really? It was good. Really good. <laughs> my my uh, Very good. partners in crime, not so much. They were like, eh, yeah. but I thought it was really good. You've obviously got very unusual taste buds. That's, that's obviously a blessing. <laughs> Dan, there's going to be a lot of people watching the movie who were involved with churches that did stay locked down. How would you want them to receive this movie? Yeah, I would, I would um, hope that they they see that I'm not bashing them necessarily, but that I'm appealing to them. Um, I don't think that the, the film is, has any kind of bitterness towards them or is name calling or anything like that. Um, And I would hope that they consider the, the argument and the headship of Christ. And that when you say to the government, yes, you can temporarily regulate our church. And you can regulate our worship. You can regulate our gathering. You can temporarily do that. When you've given them that, you essentially are handing over the headship of Christ to them. There's no way around it. You can tell yourself that you're not, but you are. You are essentially. You're saying, yeah, you you get to control how we worship. Please take over. But that's, yeah. that's something we should never do. It doesn't matter even if the statistics were true. If people were dying in the street, we should never do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and us as individuals can determine medically what we're supposed to do. That's for our health and safety. But we should never hand over the church to the state, no matter what. And I hope that they walk away with that so that in the future, because it's going to happen again, that they're like, yeah, you know what? I guess this does matter. And it, it, we 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 should not have bought the line that it was OK for us to hand it over or somehow that we were being a good Christian testimony by handing over the headship of Christ temporarily to the state because they wrapped it in this. If you don't do it, you're not a loving person. You know, if you, that's how, well, we're a loving person. So I guess, I guess I'll give you the headship of Christ. That was a trick. Yeah. Yeah, Don't do it. That's what I hope they walk away with. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you that from the feedback that you've received so far, if the government were to try and enforce another lockdown in the future, do you think the church at large would respond differently? I think they would. I don't know at large, but I believe that there would definitely be more churches that would do what we did for sure. 
and it would be more galvanized. I think we will be more galvanized in the future, more fortified and more knowledgeable on how to handle it. Our arguments are going to be more targeted, more crisp because we've gone through this. Um, so the church ultimately is better off. And you can see how the Lord in his sovereignty uses something that some people meant for evil, but God meant for good. Uh, because it really did help. Uh, I think our church is more united. I think the global church in general is more united. And we have our arguments and our understanding of the situation more honed in. So, yes, I think it will be more. But, you know, it's a little fuzzy of what is the true church and what is just Christendom. So right. uh, I think that, you know, what is called Christian that may may not be Christian will do the same thing. And they will definitely be the majority and will be the minority. I don't think that's going to change. But I think we are yeah. more fortified and there's going to be more of us. Yeah. I think you said uh, a few moments ago, when it happens again, um, has this affected your trust of a government going forward? I mean, this whole process, has it kind of left you, you know, feeling as you as you reflect on that? Yeah, I remember the first two weeks when we the whole 15 days to stop the spread. And I remember when it started, I was like, OK, I, I'll, I'll buy that. And then after a week, I was like, you know. My dad always said that if the government takes something from you, they never give it back unless you make them give it back. Yeah. He said that to me, and I'm like, I'm going to see if that's true. Because they said 15 days. Because if after 15 days they extend this, then I'm going to be really skeptical. And if they extend it and it becomes indefinite, well, then dad was right, wasn't he? And uh, sure enough, at the end of 15 days, that's exactly what they did. And I realized they're not going to give this back to us unless we take it back, unless we make them and call them out. Um, so I was skeptical of the government before. It just confirmed those things. And honestly, it's like some things you're like, you know, you used to say that's what conspiracy theorists say. But now you're like, man, all these conspiracies are coming true. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. crazy. And so yeah. I would say I'm definitely more skeptical of the government. I'm I'm more fortified as a Christian. I have a better understanding of true anthropology of man because I knew we were depraved before, but now you, you get more and more examples of, yes, and the government is filled with depraved people. Therefore, yeah. we should not assume that the government is neutral. Yeah. And we need to understand, which is, what is the government? Well, well the government's always going to be the most powerful thing in your community. So you have depraved people running the government so you should be skeptical you should we need to have checks and balances we need to be aware that hey the government could become a monster really quick and history has shown that so yeah i'm definitely it wasn't an epiphany i was there before but now it's just confirmation more confirmation more confirmation so now i'm you know one of those wacko conspiracy theorists i guess <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not because a lot of it came true. So, uh, you know, that's tell right. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shannon, we've seen the Lord use sound Christian media, such as the American gospel to have a huge, huge impact. What are your aspirations for this film? Yeah, I, um, I don't know. Uh, when we made this, honestly, we didn't know what we were going to be able to pull off. Uh, a theatrical release was not in, in the cards at the beginning. Nobody was right. talking about that. Now, I was thinking it, that would be great. We should try that from the beginning. But nobody else was thinking that, except, and our, our producer was thinking that, Jacob Hoffman. We were on the same page with that. But we didn't know if that was going to happen. Um, and uh, and it happened. And that was amazing. But because it's a ministry, we didn't really have control like a business would have control. Like we should, probably could have released the film in October and not during Barbieheimer. Uh, right. you know, like they're breaking records. It's like you're going to release your Christian film in theaters in the time in world history where they're actually breaking records. Uh, yeah. that's that's rough. Like that's everybody would say, don't do that. So we did it and actually had some success, which is kind of crazy because not only is our social media person doing a great job, Arlie, but it doesn't happen if people don't get on social media and word of mouth spread. And that was happening and is happening. People are posting it and talking about it. And the 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 out the 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 positive feedback that we're getting is positive feedback from people who so, are so excited they want to tell everybody else. 
Now, yeah. you know, there's a gamut, I'm sure. There's people who watch them. We're like, okay, it's cool. And then there's people who are really excited. But you need those people who are really excited. And you need a lot of them for it to actually spread. And that happened. And it did really well in the theaters. I mean, people were driving like four hours to go see it. Because they kept hearing things yeah. on social media. And like, so-and-so really loves this film. I, I'm going to go check it out. Um, so, I mean, people crossed Canada into the United States to see the film. Because there were no theaters in Canada. Uh, so that's great. That's exciting. That's the kind of buzz and excitement you want around a film. So as a filmmaker, I love that. As far as the ministry, I love that too. Because that gives that starts to snowball. And that gives the film more reach. And more people will talk about it. And therefore, more people who maybe disagreed or would give it a shot would be like, well, maybe I should check it out. I mean, I can't stand John MacArthur. And the funny thing is, it's not about John MacArthur. They think it's about John MacArthur. It's not really, it's, it's not about him. He's just a character in it, along with all these other people who represent the church. Um, but, you know, they will give it a chance because of that. And that's what we want. We want it to be first and primarily for ministry purposes. And I think it will have an impact globally for a long time because it was received and pushed out so well. I mean, we we have pre-orders for Blu-rays and DVDs on our website right now. We won't have the DVDs until the end of August, but you can pre-order them now, which is probably something we should say. If you go to EssentialChurchMovie.com, that's where you get all the information on the movie, EssentialChurchMovie.com, and you can still see it in the theaters for a short amount of time. I don't know how much longer, but we have pre-orders for DVDs and Blu-rays, and eventually you'll have the ability to, I imagine, to buy like on iTunes, if they still call it that. I don't know what they call it now, Apple TV or you right, know right. android whatever it is you know where you buy your movies digitally that will be available and i'm sure it will be streaming somewhere um we have to still work that out um but uh yeah you can go to the website and you can even scroll down on the home page and put in your email and subscribe and then you'll be updated for this production and any production we do in the future yeah. um but uh yeah so that has been the sales on that have been pretty like uh, people want it and uh, it's skyrocketing right now. And so we're really pleased with how everybody's receiving it and the scope that it's being sent out. Here's another thing. On our premiere night, July 23rd, so the movie came out July 28th, but we had a premiere at our church, but we didn't have it just a premiere at our church. We had a premiere at over 200 churches around the globe. So there were churches in New Zealand, Australia. I think there may have been one in the UK. Um uh canada and all over the u.s and it was crazy to think that this film was being viewed by the global church all at the same time yeah, it was really you. neat i was going to see my premiere of the film and then at the same time getting this feedback from other churches at the same time that were watching it, it was like this is kind of amazing to be a part of it what kindness yeah. god has for me and mercy to put me in that position to where i can experience something like that, I don't deserve it. And it's not lost on me, his sovereignty over the whole thing. Yeah. And it's so how God works as well. You mentioned the fact that it was released at the same time as these other two blockbusters. That's just the way God works, isn't it? He gets all the glory, yeah. stacks the odds against himself. And then, you know, he's just <laughs> so, That's so, right. so good. Yeah. We're going to make sure you mentioned, you mentioned the link to the, uh, to, to pre-order the dvds um and to see where it's still showing in cinemas we're going to make sure that that's in the description so wherever you're watching or listening to this interview make sure that you go and click on that and check it out and also make sure that you give these guys your email address so that you can find out about all the other exciting projects coming up as well so shannon what is the action point that you want people to take away after watching this movie what, what's the what's the action that you want them to take yeah that's a good question i want them to take away Main, the, the first and main point is that Christ is worthy. He is so worthy and that he he owns his church. He bought it with his blood and we are his body and he is our head. You cannot dismember the head from the body even temporarily. You, yeah. you, you, if you do that, you are doing something that the Bible commands us not to do. And it, and uh, you know, it doesn't matter what the world tells you. No, you, you have to or you're not going to be a loving person. No, you have to, or humanity will perish. I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, this is ridiculous. Um, I want them to walk away with valuing Christ more and valuing his position in the church even more 
and in their life. That's what I'd like to see. And just kind of fortifying themselves around that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned Grace Productions. What is the long-term plan of the organization? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I think that is still being discussed. We don't know exactly what we're going to do next. We figure because of how this is done and it's done well, uh, it's been received well by our church and um, and abroad, that we will probably do something in the future. But I don't know what that is. And uh, we have to just get through this and let the dust settle. Now, we have little things we're working on, like we have a kid's show and other stuff that you know um, is in the docket to do. Um, but as far as like the future grandiose vision kind of thing, I think everybody has to kind of wrap their head around this because this is something the church has never done before. Grace Community Church has never done anything like this. As I mentioned earlier in my interview, I could I could see that the church was moving. I don't know if everybody else saw it, but I saw that that door open where church was moving through a media position or a media point of view that was not there before, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Maybe mm -hmm. others would disagree with me, but I saw them moving towards media like they had never done before. And so I think that's continuing with this film and we'll see what that develops into. Sometimes I have plans in my head and I think I know what I want it to be. And then the Lord is always kind of like, yeah, just kind of like the, the Scottish thing. That's good, but I got something better. And yeah, maybe that yeah. will happen again. Who knows what's going to happen? The Lord's sovereign. We'll see what he does. Yeah. We'll make sure that you give your email address so you can be one of the first to find out. Shannon, you already mentioned this isn't a film about John MacArthur, but having such close-up access to him whilst filming this movie must have been a real joy. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, it was a real joy because I really respect him a lot. Uh, he's my pastor. I love him. Um, he's had probably the most impact on my Christian life um, by teaching God's word um, clearly, his expository preaching. I mean, it's affected me more than probably anything else because it's God's word. And, you know, his desire to be careful with God's word and to make sure it's being pushed and exercised into the congregation accurately is his job. And he's doing that well. So I have a lot of respect for him, a lot of love for him, but I never went up and talked to him before this. It's a big church. I don't go up and say, I want to introduce myself. Will you sign my Bible or anything like that? I, <laughs> I just was never, I was like, I'm not going to bug the man, right? There's, we have 40 elders. It's a big church. I'm being ministered to. I have leadership in my life. I'm plugged in. I don't need to be discipled by John MacArthur, and I'm probably it's probably not going to happen anyway. Um, he's a busy guy, and he's fulfilling his role within this body of the local church, you know, as the pastor teacher. He's his job is to be prepared every Sunday from the pulpit and preach accurately, you know. Um, yeah. And he doesn't micromanage the church or anything like that. So anyway, so when this uh, opportunity arised, I was like, well, now I finally get down to talk to him. I can actually just have a conversation with him. And if you notice, the same way we're talking right now, um, I don't know what you're looking at, but I'm looking directly at you because I see your reflection in a, a angled glass and I don't see the lens. That's how we set it up. And that's how I set it up through the documentaries because you know they're, they're looking directly at the lens, but the reality is they don't see the lens in the documentary. They just see my face. Right. So I really right. did have, I really just had a conversation with John MacArthur. He's not looking into a lens of a camera. He is looking into my face. Visually, I'm somewhere else in the room and he can hear me. But yeah. as far yeah. as he knows, I'm right there and he's connecting with me. And that's why those interviews are, I wanted that because I wanted the full face. You notice I never cut to a B cam. I never cut to a C cam. It's only the A cam. And I stayed true and pure to that. I was scared of that choice. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to pull it off. So I always had a B cam, but when I got into post, I was like, I am going to try to be committed to never cutting away from the A cam. And I never do. Um, and I just keep straight on and that conversation with another human being. And I had that with John MacArthur for four different days, sometimes up to four hours. And I asked him about everything. I asked him about his childhood. I asked him about it, all kinds of things, everything. And he, he was really kind because I think he realized this has nothing to do with the film. <laughs> <laughs> uh he even said at one point like after it was all done he's like he's like you know i had to exercise a little bit of faith because shannon would ask me these questions and i was thinking to myself what does this got to do with anything yeah 
but he never complained. He never said, hey, why are you doing this? Why are you asking me these questions? Um, but I thought, it, so it was personally, I wanted to do that personally because I just wanted to have a conversation with my pastor. Right. But I also did it because I didn't know when I was going to be have an opportunity to do this. And we should get some of this stuff on film. Even if I don't yeah. use it, I want these stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who knows when when the church might want to use these stories again? I don't know if everybody's fully documented it from beginning to end like that. So, but I did in those interviews. I really just went for it, and he let me do it, and he was very kind and never complained. So you great. now know his it. favorite. So you now know his favorite color, his favorite aftershave. <laughs> I did. No, I didn't ask him that, but I did ask him things like, yes. "You notice there's a shot of him pouring tea." I found out in the interview yeah. he doesn't drink coffee. He said, I said, because uh, I'm a big coffee drinker. And I said, uh, do you drink coffee? Uh, and he said, no, I'm a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> so he only drinks tea. So, yeah, there's a shot of yeah. him pouring tea in the mill. Yeah. So I was like, well, I'm going to put him drinking tea. <laughs> yeah, really good stuff. Really good stuff. Shannon, in 20 years time, 30 years time, when you're looking back at this season in your life, what do you think some of your best memories from this project will be? Yeah. Um, I think the, the enjoyment of, uh, I, being on the road for 35 days was absolutely wonderful. And it was an adventure. And I traveled to Scotland, to London. Uh, I was near Oxford because we had to do an interview, um, for a, an individual who was going to school at Oxford. He was going to our church at that time, but he was in Oxford at the time. So I had to go to Oxford. So I actually saw things that I always wanted to see, but I saw it in a way that was unique. And I saw it with the camaraderie of, uh, you know, two brothers in Christ on this adventure with me, um, Seth and Nate. And uh, it was an adventure. We had to work, but the work required us to explore. And exploring is an adventure. When you explore, you're on an adventure. So my work was to explore Scotland. Oh, cool. it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> I mean, I had to explore Scotland to find the locations that were going to work for the things that I was seeing in my head and how I wanted to cut this all together and make these stories work. Um, and so that was absolutely amazing because I didn't see it as a tourist. I saw it really as an adventurer as an explorer who had to document these things and film these things so that I could come back and make something out of them. And that's way more satisfying than being a tourist uh, and yeah. going and see a strange land. Um, I got to see so many things and learn so many things. I got a tour of Oxford from a student inside Oxford and he showed me all of it. You know, I wasn't planning to look where C.S. Lewis got saved or where his office was or any of that. I didn't have any of that on the docket. The Lord just gave me that stuff. So I would work all day creating, doing what I love to do, you know, fashioning this story and figuring out and problem solving the camaraderie of two believers having a blast on an adventure, exploring new lands. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. So that really Thank was you. the highlight of, of my experience. But all of it was awesome. Working with the team here was awesome. Uh, the post-production was grueling, but, but awesome. We all got to work together and collaborate together and make this work. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was just, it, it was, it was, it was a really satisfying project and it was worth quitting my job and coming on board. It was worth the risk. I'm glad I walked through that metaphorical door that I saw opening at Grace Church and went through it and God in his sovereignty. I mean, people did not micromanage me. John MacArthur did not micromanage me. Nobody got in my way. People left me alone. They would eventually give notes and things like that, but uh, it was essentially up to me. And I really, that's unique. I think yeah. it's unique. I've worked in all kinds of corporate settings. A church is still corporate and that's even unique within a church. And I think it's unique within our church. And I'm kind of in awe that that's how it unfolded, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. With Shannon, I absolutely loved the movie. I've loved speaking to you about it as well. Thank you so much for your time. Before we let you go, uh, take a moment to let us know your closing thoughts and also let people know how they can follow you on social media. Yeah, you can follow me on social media. I'm at SP Halliday on Instagram and Twitter. On Facebook, I don't know what I am. It's just Shannon Paul Halliday. Um, 
And uh, those are the three main ones, I guess. But mainly, I, I, I function mainly on Twitter. I do do Instagram. Uh, so yeah, at SP Halliday. You can also follow at Grace Productions um, on Instagram and Twitter as well. Um, and then our website, EssentialChurchMovie.com. Scroll to the bottom of the page and subscribe, and then you'll be updated on everything concerning this project and any future project. Um, and closing thoughts. Um, yeah, I just personally, like I, I think I've already shared that I'm in awe of the whole thing and how the Lord in his sovereignty and kindness answered prayers that I prayed 10 years ago. I prayed for stuff like this 10 years ago yeah. and um, tried to make things happen and they didn't happen. And then when things, when I didn't try to make things happen, they just happened again, right. you know, the way the Lord he does things the way he is choosing to do so, but he did answer that prayer. And I recognize that. And that is moving to me. It's uh, it affects me when I know that the God of the universe who holds the, in the span of his hand, hears my prayers. Um, so uh, I guess I'll leave your audience with that. I think that's the most important thing. I know that technically wasn't what the film is about, but in a way it was God was sovereign yeah. over the whole lockdown thing. He, he is sanctifying his church. We think we know what we're doing, but he actually has a plan that's even better. And even through the lockdowns, it's better. Even through having a, a terrible president like Biden, <laughs> it's better. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to, God's sovereign over all that. He's not surprised. Just be faithful to the Lord, knowing he is sovereign, and don't worry about the results. Yeah, yeah. Shannon, God bless you, my friend. It's been a real joy speaking to you. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you so much. It's been a joy talking to you.